Spinosaurus aegypticus is one of the world's most beloved theropod dinosaurs. Its crocodilian morphology, charismatic sail, and controversial lifestyle have earned it a place in the heart of paleo nerds everywhere. And while it was a success in Cretaceous North Africa, would its A-list charm be enough to keep it alive on an alien world? That's right, today we'll be putting Spinosaurus on James Cameron's Pandora, a place known for its bizarre monsters, rare minerals, and oddly humanoid civilizations. Could Spinosaurus survive? How would it adapt to a strange new ecosystem? Let's find out together. Before we get started, make sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and check out the other spec ecology videos on the channel. Also follow Madly Mesozoic, who's part of this analysis. The more creators making content like this, the better, and I'm stoked to team up with one of my personal favorites. For this scenario, let's say that a breeding population of 1,000 adult Spinosaurus wake up one day in an environment totally different from the sunny mangrove forest they're used to. The sand and shores of northern Africa have changed to the towering trees, giant ferns, creeping moss, and mountain shadows of the Kingler Forest on the moon of Pandora. In this experiment, the theropods would notice several things right off the bat. First, they can't breathe. Pandora's atmosphere is extraordinarily thick with carbon dioxide, methane, and hydrogen sulfide compared to Earth, making it toxic for air-breathing animals that aren't adapted to its unique cocktail. For the purposes of this video, we're going to wave that part away, although the atmosphere is still more dense than that of Earth. Another immediate impact is the lower gravity. While some sources differ on the exact amount, the Avatar Wiki claims that Pandora has gravity 80% that of Earth's. This is part of what allows the terrestrial animals to grow to such immense sizes so easily, like the humanoid Navi, which are about 8 to 9 feet tall on average. The Spinosaurus population would find it easier to move as they begin to spread out, in an attempt to establish territory and find bodies of water large enough to hunt in. Along those lines, we're also assuming that the life on Pandora is carbon-based, and that the animals not specifically known to be toxic are edible. Spec Evo is no fun when you can't breathe or eat. Additionally, the dinosaurs appear on a Pandora that has never encountered humans. The Kinglore Forest is a huge rainforest area on the western frontier, a continent explored in the Frontiers of Pandora video game. It's named after the native silk moth, the Kinglore, and is riddled with rivers that the Spinosaurus group would love. A tribe of Navi known as the Aranahe live in Kinglor, and they work with the rainforest's namesake to weave clothing and shelter. While certainly curious about these new animals, the Aranahe would likely not be a threat. Like most Navi, they tend to keep to themselves and avoid provoking large predators when possible. The first order of business for the exiled Spinosaurus would be food. While they were specialized fish eaters, Spinosaur teeth found in pterosaur vertebrae show that they weren't above eating other small to medium animals that weren't aquatic. After arriving on this new world, a thousand megatheropods would want to find a stable food source. What would they encounter as they meandered to the rivers? First up is the scarab crawler, a tusk scavenger with an external shell. Crawlers move in groups and can lift up their shells in an intimidation display. They're about the size of a small horse, making them considerably smaller than the Spinosaurus. They wouldn't be ideal prey, however, given their armor, speed, pack behavior, and terrestrial lifestyle. A spino wouldn't turn down an injured scarab crawler that can't escape, but they're not the first choice either. Carnivorous fish, and as much as anything alien could be said to technically be a fish, they're about four feet long and can hold their breath, moving from the water to the shore to catch prey. Their tough fins allow them to move in the mud and sludge of shorelines, and they've developed raptorial pedipalps to snatch up small animals. Their facial tendrils are sensitive to vibrations and helpful for detecting the location of their victims. All in all, mud crawlers are just about the perfect food for a wandering Spinosaurus. They're found in the water and near the water, aren't terribly fast, and are large enough to provide plenty of meat without presenting a large risk to the dinosaur. The octofin fish, found near forest seaweed, is another excellent meal option. They're slightly larger than mud crawlers and usually travel alone in river systems, and are often eaten by the Navi. The population density is high enough that Spinosaurus would take advantage of their numbers, even though their camouflage makes them difficult to track from above. Some may find it beneficial to hunt further away from the waterline, going after prey like the Tapiris. Three foot long omnivores, they have armored backs but are commonly eaten by bigger predators. Some populations have been domesticated by the Navi, so the Spinosaurus invasives would need to steer clear of the pet variety and focus on wild stock. Those that didn't would learn quickly to avoid the Navi, intelligent warriors with the weaponry of Stone Age humans, but with their physical abilities dialed up to 11. The largest herbivore in the area that would be suitable prey for Spinosaurus is the Sturm Beast. They're about 900 kilograms as adults and live in herds, frequenting the shoreline. While they're large and covered in armor, the Avatar Wiki describes them as very slow, both physically and mentally, although they will employ group defense against threats, which would definitely be a problem for a lone Spino. Despite that, they still fall victim to local predators when not in prime condition, and may represent occasional meals for particularly large Spinosaurus individuals. 
While there are other large herbivores in the area, they would be less than suitable prey for Spinosaurus. Hexapedes are the Pandoran equivalent of gazelles or antelope and could easily outpace most theropods. Titanotheres represent the other extreme. They're simply too big and heavily armored to realistically consider attacking. They travel in herds of over a dozen individuals and represent if Terran rhinos evolved the body size of exceptionally large ceratopsians with armor and attitude to match. Any Spinosaurus worth its sail will stay far away. Titanotheres are not the worst thing lurking in the jungle, however. To talk about the threats that Spinosaurus will be facing, I'll bring in my friend, Madly Mesozoic. Hey, hey, ladies and gentle sores. Glad I could pop in for this one. So, like Vividen was saying, the jungles of Pandora are a hot boiling soup of many different crazy unique animals. First, we have the Viper Wolf, or the Nanteng, as the Navi call them. These six-legged hellhounds are cooperative, intelligent pack hunters. They're pretty high up on the food chain in the Kinglor Forest, with animals even larger than them knowing to steer clear. Chiefly nocturnal, they scour both the canopy and the forest floor in packs of up to a dozen individuals. Using a variety of barks, yelps, as well as gestures with their oddly sapient hands to coordinate with one another. Their dark skin allows them to move swiftly and undetected under the cover of night, with subtle bioluminescent glows, unique to each pack. Upon first glance, these guys don't seem like they'd be too much of a threat to a fearsome animal such as the Spinosaurus, coming in at a length of 6 to 7 feet, or about 2 meters head to toe, weighing over 150 pounds or 68 kilograms, and standing about half as tall as a human, certainly there's a large size difference here. In the first Avatar movie, when Neytiri swings in and starts showing the Viper Wolves attacking Jake the business, we see that they are susceptible to intimidation. Now, given the aforementioned difference in size, surely the Viper Wolves would be intimidated by Spinosaurus, and wouldn't attack the dinosaur directly in most cases. The threat these animals would pose to Spinosaurus in terms of competition is more likely using their numbers to bully the dinosaur away from its own kills, maybe even outright stealing their kills or large chunks of flesh off a carcass, and swiftly retreating into the canopy. While an adult Spinosaurus is certainly no animal to be harassing, younger Spinosaurus and Spinosaurus eggs may very well be on the menu for a large pack of Viper Wolves. Though while Spinosaurus might have little to fear from the Viper Wolves in their adulthood, it could be a serious obstacle to overcome when reproducing and spreading across Pandora. We have the infamous Thanator, or the Palulu Khan. These fearsome hunters are unrivaled in the ecosystems of Pandora, standing proudly at the top of the food chain. The lion-like Thanator boasts an impressive size of 5.5 meters, or 18 feet in length, and stands at 2.5 meters, or 8.2 feet tall at the shoulder. They move at this size gracefully throughout the rainforest at a speed of up to 40 miles per hour, or nearly 65 kilometers per hour. The senses of the Thanator are so greatly developed, they can sense prey items from up to 8 miles away. For these prey items, they come equipped with an arsenal of weaponry. Powerful crushing jaws lined with gnashing 9-inch teeth, a muscular armored tail that can break bone with a swift strike, as well as razor-sharp claws lying at the end of each of its six limbs. The Palulu Khan are described as the lords of the King Lore Forest, reigning over and preying upon anything it wishes. From the lowly Tapirus to the great hammerhead Titanothere, instilling a primal sense of fear into the hearts of all. The Navi, who dance and sing songs in honor of all the beasts of the planet, have no songs to sing about the Palulu Khan, as just the thought of them will invoke fear and despair. Their name in the Navi language translates literally to Dry Mouth Bringer of Fear. The Thanator would immediately see the presence of Spinosaurus as a threat to their domain. Who do these strange lumbering beasts think they are, waltzing into their kingdom? It is very likely that the Thanator will go out of its way to challenge and dispatch a Spinosaurus in its territory, even if it isn't necessarily in direct competition with it. While there remains a hefty size difference between the two, the Thanator is no stranger to taking down large opponents. Using its previously mentioned arsenal of weaponry, it can take down even a Hammerhead Titanothere, who is many times larger than the Spinosaurus and heavily armored. So, this wouldn't be a very long fight. Certainly the claws and teeth of a Spinosaurus can do a lot of damage, which could win them some points, I suppose, but truthfully I don't think this ends well for them. The Spinosaurus has never seen anything remotely like a Thanator. The animal is far too agile, powerful, and well-armed to even risk engaging. It would serve the Spinosaurus far better to just steer clear from any sign of a Thanator, and stick to the water's edge 
lest they invoke its wrath. Some populations of Spinosaurus, noting the dominance of other large predators in the jungle and the sky, decided to branch out and occupy other niches. One such group explored a new environment, the rich, deep soil beneath the Kinglor Forest. These theropods became adapted for digging tunnels and building large, hive-like communities, only emerging in huge groups to hunt and bring food back below ground. These events are known to the Navi as Sianquit, or Death Swarms, which is the name they've given to this descendant of Spinosaurus. The Sianquit shrank quite a bit compared to their bulky river-going ancestors. An average drone is 1,500 to 2,000 kilograms, about the size of a small rhinoceros. Their sails have retreated into their backs, and their claws are thick and broad, facilitating their tunneling lifestyle. Although they're smaller now, they're stocky, strong, and venomous, and can swarm over even the biggest of titanotheres in a hunt. Dozens to hundreds of drones will emerge at a time, using their powerful senses of smell in tandem with instructions from their queen to find prey items. While hexapedes and viper wolves are usually too fast, scarab crawlers, sturm beasts, bone helm rhinos, titanotheres, and even occasional thanators are on the menu. During swarms, Navi will take to the trees and avoid the ground until the last drones have disappeared back beneath the soil. The Death Swarm Queen is a massive, pale white, 20 ton beast whose sail has been replaced by a thicket of bonding cues. She can plug into crowds of drones simultaneously to gain their memories and give them commands, using their collective knowledge to plan the next attack on the surface. Her bioluminescence is a symbol of dominance in the hive. Every drone is parthenogenic and has the capacity to become a queen, but any offspring produced without the queen's authorization are swiftly killed and recycled. Outside of winning a direct challenge, a drone can only take over a hive if the current queen chooses them as her successor. She will use her bonding cues to inject her bioluminescent blood into the drone, which kickstarts a massive developmental change. The drone will grow to queen size within a year, at which point she will kill and eat the old monarch. The consciousness of previous queens is absorbed during this process, preserved within Awa. It's theorized that Awa took a direct hand in the development of this Spinosaurus variant. The Sianquit Queen has an unusual amount of control over bonding cues, and her ability to plug into root systems of trees and other plants gives her unparalleled environmental knowledge. Awa may have created this strain to act as a sort of immune system against future invasions, taking the strange new animals and retrofitting them into powerful defenses. There has never been a documented instance of a Navi successfully bonding with a Sianquit. Only two attempts are recorded, both ending with a mental breakdown and comatose state for the Navi that attempted it. The Shallow Cut The Rang Muni, or Shallow Cut in Navi, took a very different approach. Rather than competing with the durable Thanators or pack-hunting Viper Wolves, these theropods focused on their adaptations for hunting in water and took it to the next level as Awa integrated them into the global neural network, influencing their genes to develop bonding cues, the Spinosaurus populations gradually moved from the rivers to the oceans. Their paddle tail became stronger, their limbs became powerful fins, and their signature sail developed the ability to fold and twist to help them in rapid turns. The Rang Muni are considerably more massive than Earth Spinosaurus, about 17 to 20 meters long, and weighing 20 to 30 tons or more when fully grown. Their fast twitch muscle fibers are unusually well developed for Pandoran fauna, allowing them incredible bursts of speed to facilitate ambush hunting, and escape from larger predators like the Akula. Rang Muni will hunt hammerhead fish, buoy fish, mud crawlers, octofin, and elu on a regular basis. Their grasping teeth are perfect for snatching such prey in the water, and they've also developed keratinized beaks to scrape at coral and force hiding animals to flee from their shelters. Occasionally, groups of them will converge to hunt lone tolkun, which are massive, whale-like animals with great destructive power. The Rang Muni's superior speed and agility allow them to inflict wounds on the much larger tolkun, gradually bleeding them out before feasting, though this is a rare occurrence because Tolkun usually travel in groups and will defend one another fiercely. Most of the time their speed and power are enough to deal with the native fauna, but the far more massive Akula stop them from overtaking the system as the apex predator. The Shallow Cuts have also developed limited bioluminescence, but it's very different from their death swarm cousins. The blue patches on their jaw, hind fins, and sails can flash brightly, allowing for long distance communication with other members of their species. Phosphorus-filled chromatophores open and close under conscious control, enabling complex messaging without the need for sound. This communication makes the rarely occurring pack of shallow cuts a terrifying threat. The Rangmoni have an interesting relationship with the Metkaina. 
who have domesticated the Elu and the Sorox for both transport and combat. Chalukuts are regarded with deep respect by the Metkayina, a respect that is not without fear. Similar to how the Omatikaya tribe of the forest have heroes that bond with the great Leonopteryx, a Navi that bonds with a shallow cut gains a reputation for courage and skill. They become Rangmune Makto, or the Shallow Cut Rider. The Nam Sin Great Claw is a titanic omnivore held in reverence by the Zeswa clan of the Upper Plains. This is descended from Spinosaurus that left the Kingler Forest and headed north, leaving behind the Thanators, Death Swarms, and Cramped Jungle Floor. Those that survived the increased predation from the Great Leonopteryx bulked up, the biggest and strongest among them passing on their genes to the next generation. Their tails thickened, forgetting their riverside origins, and developed powerful spikes to defend against predators. Their claws went into Super Saiyan mode, now thick, strong, and perfect for both defense and for stripping leaves off the tall trees of the plains. Those that were more adventurous in their diets, branching out from fish and focusing on more terrestrial prey, were more likely to survive. The Namsin have differentiated teeth like a bear, and are happy to eat fruit and roots as well as meat. Their torso is thick and massive to allow space for fermentation chambers, making digestion of plant material possible with the aid of native gut flora. Namsin live solitary lives as adults, roaming wide areas and defending their territories from members of their own species. Clashes between Great Claws are legendary for the competitive warlike Zeswa clan, who will often lay out carrying to lure multiple Great Claws to the same site so they can watch the resulting battle. While these conflicts are rarely fatal for the Namsin themselves, any animal too close is liable to lose limbs or their lives. They're deceptively fast for their size, and one swipe is enough to disembowel even the most battle-hardened Navi warrior. Great Claws aren't limited to eating carrion, of course. They're perfectly capable of hunting actively and prefer to dine on the ubiquitous blade heads that cover the plain. Blade heads are heavily armored, slow herbivores that travel in groups, and have not yet developed a counter to the armor-piercing spikes of a Namsin's devastating tail. Soundblast Colossi are another ideal menu item. 15-meter quadrupeds with sails of their own, they can expel air at high velocities to create deafening shockwaves that incapacitate most native animals. The Namsin's armor plating has a unique microstructure that makes them highly resistant to this shockwave, allowing them to engage in close combat with the Soundblast Colossi. The one animal of the plains not on the menu is the Zakru, which is over twice the size of even the biggest Great Claws. The speed of the Great Claws' evolution is again attributed to the interference of Ewa, but the Navi question why she would invest so much strength in strangers. Some of the Zeswa Sahik, or ruling priest class, have theorized that Ewa is preparing for some sort of ecological disaster or invasion, and has taken advantage of the new blood to develop a frontline defense. Their communications with the Sahiks of the forests and shorelines have strengthened their suspicions, as similar evolutionary patterns seem to have emerged with the death swarms and shallow cuts. One thing is for certain. If any invaders were to land unprepared on this Pandora, Ewa would be very well armed to deal with them. What are your thoughts on Spinosaurus surviving on Pandora, and which speculative evolution variant was your favorite? Go subscribe to Madly Mesozoic if you haven't already, and keep an eye out for more collabs. I recommend checking out his video on Tyrannosaurus surviving in the Halo universe. It's a banger. Also, a huge thank you is due to Skyman Paleo, who did the amazing art for the Spec Evo Spinos in this video. If you've ever been interested in dinosaur stickers for your water bottles or laptops, go visit his Redbubble. Join the channel for access to loyalty badges and unique emojis, and let me know if you'd like to see more Spec Evo projects like this one. I'm considering a video on the evolution of biology of Tolkien's dragons. Comment if you're interested. And thank you all for being a part of this and supporting the channel with your interest. I'm the Vividen. And I'm Madly Mesozoic. And, and we'll, we'll see, see you, you next time. time.